Mike Miller. Welcome back to the L3 Leadership Podcast. So glad that you're here. Uh, as I just told you uh, before we jumped on to the recording, uh, you are officially the most downloaded podcast episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast. So clearly you made a connection with our audience and are adding value to leaders. So thank you so much and welcome back. Well, thanks for inviting me back. It's, it's good to see you again. Yeah. So today we want to talk all about culture. You have a brand new book out called Culture Rules. And I just want to dive right in and, and just open-endedly, you know, why did you write this book and what do you want leaders to get out of it? Well, for those that may not have heard our last episode, as I recall, I gave a little bit of backstory. And so I want to provide that again real briefly here. My team here at Chick-fil-A has been trying for the last 25 years to, to try and figure out how to help leaders grow their capacity. And I'm not just talking about personal, physical capacity. I mean, yes, and we really want to help them grow their leadership capacity. And so the strategy for now many, many years has been to try to identify issues that are emergent, things that are maybe a few years in the future, and every now and then we'll be so bold as to to tackle an issue that we think is just over the horizon. But we, we place a strategic bet that if we could serve our leaders well in, in a particular topic area, that it that it would um, it would serve them, their business, their communities, their team, and you know leaders around the world. And so we've been placing those strategic bets now for many, many years. A few years ago, as we were involved in that process, thinking about what we would work on in the future, the topic of culture emerged. We had begun to pick up what some might consider weak signals. We were we were hearing it uh, come up more often. We were getting more unsolicited questions. And honestly, we felt like a lot of leaders were struggling with culture, maybe maybe more than the historical norm. And so we said, what if we could help leaders uh, in this area? And then, of course, COVID hit. And so we're very thankful coming out of the pandemic that we've got a, an informed uh, point of view on culture, because I, I tell you what, what we believe the pandemic did. I mean, there are obviously many consequences and un, unintended you know, uh, side effects from, from the pandemic, but it put real stress on culture mm -hmm. and it, it, it did one of several things. It either showcased the strength of your culture, exposed your gaps. And for a lot of people, it was a mixed bag. And, uh, you know, we, we know organizations that really rose to the occasion and we know others that went, Oh no, you know, what's going on here? Well, I don't think COVID destroyed their culture. I think it exposed the culture that existed prior to the pandemic. And so uh, we're very, very thankful, as I said, to have a point of view coming out of the pandemic because a lot of leaders, you know, we thought we had weak signals three or four or five years ago on this topic. It is the most uh, discussed topic when I'm with leaders, even before we publish the book, they want to talk about culture. Wow. And, and my, my understanding is you, this isn't just your thoughts on culture. You and your team put a ton of research into this. Can you just, for leaders to understand yeah. the research that went into this, can you share about that? Yeah. Yes. I'll be delighted to. And just thanks for asking. Just because another word of context, we have all the work we've done. This is our 12th project over the last 25 years. And in fact, it's resulted in 12 books. And we, we work really, really, really hard not to just publish our personal bias. Now, I can't say we've eliminated all of our personal bias, but we don't start there. We start with the same question on every project. What is universally true about this topic? And and we, we always search for that. We always strive to find that because we think then you have broad application. Uh, if, if you do it well, you could, in fact, uh, discover or unearth timeless truth that that would serve leaders for for generations and so uh, we started this project that very very same way and we ended up talking to either talking to focus group or surveying over 6000 folks in 10 countries wow uh, senior leaders mid level leaders and frontline leaders we did interviews with a who's who list of leaders 
from some of the most amazing companies around the world. I mean, if, if your audience were to look at the list of the companies we interviewed, um, they would probably know 75% of the names of the companies that we interviewed. So we did a lot of work to figure out what is true about the topic of organizational culture. Yeah. And I guess I would have started at the very basics, but you know, we talk a lot about culture, but sometimes that can be hard to define. How do you define culture when it comes to organizational leadership? Well, let, let me affirm your, your observation. That is one of the challenges is there's no universally accepted definition that we could find. There are many, many, many definitions. And so we thought we would just add to the mix and, and create <laughs> our own. We felt like it was an informed point of view based on all that we had done. And we want to acknowledge that culture is an unseen force, which gives most leaders no sense of joy or revelation. I mean, you, you know, it's unseen, which actually for a lot of people adds to the angst. Okay. Like, what do you do with something? How do you steward? How do you manage? How do you monitor something you can't see? Well, the good news is we, we believe we have identified the elemental components, right? Mm -hmm. You can't see air, but you, you can name the molecules, mm -hmm. right? You know what, you know yeah. what creates it. And so we would say it is an unseen force, but it's the cumulative effect of what people see what people hear, what people experience, and what people believe. Hmm. It's the cumulative effect of what people see, hear, experience, and believe. And when we landed at that definition, we were very encouraged because who has the greatest control over what people see, hear, experience, and believe? It's leaders. Hmm. It's leaders. And so we felt like we were onto something once we we're able to give um, give what is often seen as squishy to give it more form and more structure. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, for, for leaders listening to this, how can they actually assess their culture? They may be listening to this and, and say, well, one, why is culture? I guess I'll just start there. Why is culture even important for organizations and why should leaders care? Okay. Um, well, it's important because it affects everything. It, it affects decisions, it affects performance, it affects retention, it affects sales, it affects profits. I mean, it, it, you know, Drucker, Peter Drucker, the late management and leadership thinker that some of your audience may be familiar with, I would say the greatest leadership thinker of the last 2000 years, hmm. he said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Like you work on it because you know it's important. And I will say this, you referenced the research, the research confirmed that 72% of the leaders in the United States, 70% globally, say it's the most powerful tool at their disposal to drive performance. Seven out of 10 leaders already know that. So if any of your folks do pick up the book, you'll notice there's not a lot of ink devoted to making the case for culture. Because we said, we think that word count can be better used on helping leaders create a high performance culture. Let's don't try to convince leaders of something that they that they already know intuitively, experientially, intellectually. They know it's critical. And there was nothing that they listed as a more powerful driver of performance. But now here's let me let me let the other shoe fall before you ask your follow up question. We asked those same leaders to rank their priorities. Hmm. Creating and maintaining culture came in at number 12 in the U.S. Wow. And so that became our challenge. How do you help leaders close this knowing doing gap? Because if, if, if it's your 12th priority, it's no wonder that most cultures are in shambles. Wow. Yeah. So clearly I don't, I, I agree with you. We don't need to convince leaders that the culture is important, but like you said, we don't prioritize it or focus on it. And I think the starting point for many leaders is how do I actually assess the health of okay. my culture? Yeah. How do I actually yeah. measure it? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to dodge the question for just a moment. I'll, I'll come back okay. to it. Keep me honest here. You can't assess it until you decide what you want it to be. Assess mm -hmm. against what? So uh, again, I don't want to give away too much here and I want to, I want to honor you in the process and let you ask your questions, but I want to, I want to frame yeah. this. We, we distilled all this down to three rules. 
we said, we want to help leaders close this knowing doing gap. And we came up with three rules. And, and I need to tell you about the first rule, because the first rule is to aspire. You have to share your hopes and dreams for your culture. Now, it's crazy that you would have to start there. And our team debated, like, do we have to say that? Well, we met far too many leaders who couldn't articulate their hopes and dreams for their culture. Now, some of them would say, well, it's in my head, it's in my heart. And and my response is, it's great to start there, but you can't create it by yourself. So you have to share it with others. And and you've got to be able to share it in a way that is clear and it's simple and it's repeatable because some people can explain it. And an hour later, you're still trying to say, OK, let me try to get the essence of that. Right. Again, back to Drucker one more time when asked about the uh, the challenge of creating mission statements. That was the language that was posed to him many years ago. He said, if you can't put it on a T-shirt, you don't have it yet. Hmm. Well, what I think he's saying is clear, simple, repeatable, right? You can write volumes about it later. You can, you can illuminate and, and ex- expand and illustrate, but, but can you state it succinctly? What is the essence of your aspiration? So to your question of measurement, well, now you know what you're measuring against. If you want to be customer centric, you can measure that. If, uh, give you an example. Uh, Satya Nadella, when he took over at Microsoft for Steve Ballmer, he he set a new aspiration. He said he wanted them to move from being know-it-alls to being learn-it-alls. Wow. From know-it-alls to learn-it-alls. And again, there's a rich backstory. I wrote about some of it uh, in the book, but there's a rich backstory. Uh, Ballmer had been great at, at extracting profits from the business, but he had not been great on creating a preferred future. And that's what basically cost him his job. Hmm. And so Nadella understood that and said, we've got to change our mindset. So with a new aspiration, I'm I'm getting to your question. We want to move from, from know-it-alls to learn-it-alls. He said, our primary metric to your question is going to be growth mindset. Hmm. They used the, the work that Carol Dweck had done on that concept and said, we're going we're gonna to try to help everyone in the organization develop a growth mindset. And you can measure that. So the metric is aligned with the aspiration. Yeah, I think it's so interesting that you said so many leaders, you know, you would think it was common sense to actually have a vision and actually share that. But so many leaders don't. Um, do you have any advice for leaders on obviously making it simple, repeatable? I think that's great. But as far as the actual process of getting this on paper, you know, is that a yeah. team retreat? Is it getting away? And then how, how often should they communicate that to their, their organization? OK, so I heard two, two really good questions there. So here's my here's my encouragement to leaders. Don't get hung up in the semantics or the language trap. And here's what I mean by that. Anybody that any of your audience that's done any study, reading or paying attention, they know that some people define mission the the way that other people define vision. And some people define vision the way other people define purpose. And you can find really smart people, uh, people I look up to, coaches, mentors, peers, who define those terms very differently. Don't get caught up in that. So you need to decide what are your hopes and dreams, and then which of the mechanisms at your disposal will be most helpful. Do you want vision? Do you want mission? Do you want purpose? Because you can parse those out as different things. Maybe you want all three. But again, the more you add, the more complex it is. Maybe you want to use ethos um, as uh, Netflix has done. They want to create an ethos of freedom and responsibility. Right. So you can you, I'm, I'm one of our Chick-fil-A operators I met with. Uh, he had an ethos. He didn't. He, he said, I want to keep it really simple. I don't have mission, purpose, vision, values, but I've got an ethos. And he could describe it pretty well. And that's what his whole leadership team and his whole organization had gathered around. The ethos is the spirit of the organization. What is that? What does that look like? You can use values. I mean, these are all mechanisms at your disposal. So my my encouragement to leaders is don't get hung up on the semantics. Figure out what kind of organizational culture you want and then choose the the tools, techniques, mechanisms that 
best enable you to communicate. So that's the first thing. Your second question was how frequently? Well, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And I have been challenged on that at a, at a profound level. Hmm. During one of my interviews with a senior leader from Netflix, and I ask, how often do you talk about culture? And he looked at me with this kind of quizzical look, like I didn't even know what he was thinking. It was like he was it was he was looking at me really strange. And he said, What do you mean? He said, What do you mean? I'm like, well, I thought it was a pretty simple question. I said, How often do you think you talk about culture? And he said, Every day. Wow. He said, every leader at Netflix talks about the culture or some aspect of the culture every day. That's amazing. <clears throat> yeah. I had another leader challenge. I had another leader challenge me even further. He said, you should talk about some aspect of the vision was the language he chose about the aspiration in every meeting. He said, and if you haven't talked about it by the end of the meeting, you should close the meeting linking what you just talked about to the vision. And he said, and if what you just talked about doesn't link to the vision, then you got to ask yourself, why are we talking about this? Wow. So I'm trying to up my game to talk about vision a lot more. I've even taken it a step further and I try to reference it in the majority of the emails I send. Come on. Wow. I do. I'm trying. I'm working hard. I want to do. I mean, this is a global best practice. The, the, the thriving high performance cultures, leaders are talking about facets and pieces and parts of the aspiration almost continuously. So every meeting, every day, every email. I love it. I'm, tr I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Mark, you know, in, in your research, you got to spend time with some phenomenal companies. I, obviously, you were surprised by how many leaders didn't have a clear vision that, that they communicate. Were there other factors that were consistent in organizations that maybe didn't have the best culture that you saw that the leaders didn't do or did do that were that had negative effects? You know, there there are a lot of toxins out there. And we wrote we wrote about, I don't know, six or eight or 10 of them in the book. And if, if you don't deal with the toxins, they metastasize and they become maladies and they will literally kill an organization. And we talked about some organizations that did not survive because they let their culture destroy them, right? They, they rotted you know, from the inside out. Um, yeah. I, I, if I had to put a bow on it, I think it would it would go back to lack of focus and intentionality. That's the common thing that leaders wow. let let this happen on their watch. Again, you can't build culture by yourself, but the the leaders and the senior leader, you are the champion and the guardian of the culture. Wow. You um you mentioned Netflix already. You mentioned Microsoft. Were there any others that were your personal favorites, organizations that you met with that maybe you had an aha moment similar to the everyday culture moment? Were there other ahas and profound impacts like that? I mean, there were there were scores of those. I mean, we worked on this for several years. And wow. I mean, you can imagine the data that came from those 6,000 surveys and interviews. Uh, yeah, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of pages of of data and reports because we cut it by country. We cut it by uh, level, you know, we cut it by tenure, we cut it by industry type. And it was, there were, there were many, many, many insights. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that rises to the occasion. Um, yeah. I, again, this was probably, I'm not sure if it qualifies as a, as an insight, but the intentionality as, as a theme, it's like leaders animate culture or not. Mm -hmm. And every organization has a culture. See, this is the thing that some, I'm not sure how this got lost in translation for leaders. Every organization has a culture. It's either by design or default. 
The problem is we haven't found any great cultures that were an accident. <laughs> They're designed. They're designed by leaders. And so that was kind of a progressive revelation. It might have been an intuitive thing in the beginning, but research, interview, focus group, quant study, you know, desk research, it just became more and more and more obvious that this is clearly on the leader. Yeah. Clearly. And, and people have accused me of thinking that everything's on the leader. Well, most everything is right. Either, either their action or lack thereof, everything rises and falls on leadership. And, um, so I don't know. It was just the preponderance of the evidence was overwhelming when leaders are intentional when leaders are focused you can create a great culture and when they're not you kind of get what you get yeah on that note I'm, I'm curious your input on this so let's say a leader if, if an organization has an unhealthy culture or a negative culture uh how often can the leader that is actually in place maybe that has allowed this or unintentionally created that culture uh, how how long can they actually turn it around? How long does that often take? Or does it literally, in most cases, take a new leader to reset and change a culture? You know, I don't know that we have any data to support that. So I want to be really clear. We've talked a lot about the data. I'll yeah. give you my opinion on that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's a deep and profound observation. You ready? <laughs> I can't wait. It, it depends. It depends. <laughs> okay. It depends. Because, I mean, the leader controls the levers that create the culture. And above all else, the leader controls their own behavior. And the number one way, the, I mentioned the first rule, the second rule is to amplify you've got to constantly reinforce the aspiration. Well, the number one thing we discovered to reinforce the aspiration is the behavior of the leader. People wow. always watch the leader. Role modeling is the number one. People watch whether you want them to or not. It's the number <laughs> one way to impact the behavior of an organization. It's what are the behaviors the leader is engaged in? Not what are the behaviors the leader talks about, but what is the leader actually doing? Hmm. And so um, I think there, there are an infinite number of turnaround stories. So I do want to say leaders can, leaders can um, revive hmm. a, a, a dying culture, but they've got to be intentional. They've got to be, they've got to be st strategic. They've got to have that aspiration that they're going back to. And, and yes, I think, I think leaders can fix it often unless they've got some internal wiring or, or something. I mean, if their ego's too big, I mean, we're, I'm working on a separate project and the number one uh, impediment to leadership effectiveness globally is ego. Wow. Uh, we've got data on that. That's the next book, but that that's probably another blinding flash of the obvious. But, um, you ask people about the number one thing that keeps their boss from being more effective and globally, the answer is ego. And it's at all levels, frontline supervisors for mid-level, mid-level for CEO. It's like, what's, what keeps your boss from being more effective as a leader? They all say ego number one. So you might have an ego that says, what's wrong with this culture? I built this culture. Huh. Uh, there is, by the way, a reality gap that we see globally. We've now seen this in several of our studies. Leaders tend to think things are about 40 points better than they really are. If you believe <laughs> the, if you believe the frontline people. Wow. Even like, is this a great place to work? Leaders are going to score that typically 40 points ahead of the frontline work. So there is a there is a reality challenge that leaders have to continue to work on, which is why back to your very first question, why listening is so important. Yeah, you talk about listening to us. Can you talk about just the importance of listening and maybe some yeah, practices we, that are good for leaders? Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, we talked about one form of listening is metrics, but I, I would never uh, put all of my faith in metrics alone. I think metrics are part of, of a, a suite of listening uh, tools, mechanisms, and strategies. One is just one-on-one conversations. And I know that sounds like bizarre, and some of your listeners may be leading really big organizations or have really large teams and go, what do you mean one-on-one conversations? Yeah, uh, Howard Bihar, the former, uh, I guess he was the president of Starbucks, took them from about 16 stores to whatever, 16,000. I got to spend a little time with him, and he said, you can put all this stuff on paper, and you can put it all on the posters, and you can put you know put it on cups and you can put it everywhere right put it on a t-shirt he said it doesn't get real until you have real conversations one on one that's when it gets real when you're talking to people about this stuff and listening to these people so one strategy is one on one conversations another again you know turn it up just a little bit are focus groups and again, some people are big fans, some aren't fans at all, but put eight or 10 people in a room and talk about your culture. It's fascinating. Um, going to the field, if you have a, an organization that has decentralized locations, spend time in the field. You'll, you'll be shocked at what you'll learn. Every time I go to the restaurant, I've been doing this for almost 45 years. Every time I go in the restaurants, I learn something. Leaders learn something when they get close to the customer. Uh, and of course, I haven't even mentioned listening to the customer because you think, well, if this is about culture, is this all internal listening? Well, cul- customers know your culture, too, because they're the recipients of your culture. So are you listening to customers? Are you spending time with them? So, yeah, I just think there are many, many ways that leaders can listen. You just got to commit to listen. And then you got to respond. You got to respond based on what you hear. That third rule is to adapt. You have aspire, amplify, and adapt. And adapt means to constantly be working on how to enhance your culture. And so if you see toxins, you have to attack those immediately. If you don't see toxins, you need to think about ways you could double down on your strengths. That's a way to enhance your culture. And then third, you can add new capabilities. And people often overlook that. We did that about 15 years ago. We, it was the decision was made by senior leaders that we needed to be more innovative. Now, we weren't strangers to innovation. I mean, Truett Cathy invented the chicken sandwich, right? But if you looked at our history of innovation, it was, it was somewhat sporadic and it would tend to pop up here and there. And we said, what if we were more innovative as a culture? And so we set that as a new aspiration. We went about amplifying that. And here we are 15 years later. And I would argue we're much more innovative today. But you, you've always got to be doing something with what you're hearing. That listening wow. only matters if you respond. No, I think that's so good. It's it's funny, you know, as I work with leaders and leadership teams, how many times that people actually on the front lines don't actually think the leaders will actually listen. And if they do listen, that they'll actually do something with what they heard. Uh, I've just been blown away by I, I, it's probably a lack of trust in leadership that they'll actually do something. And the, the whole ego thing, when does that come out, by the way, for those listening, give them a little trailer. Oh, that's the 2024 book. Okay. So we got another year, but hopefully we can have a conversation around that. Um, under the whole umbrella of the Amplify section of the book, uh, you, you already mentioned it. You know, we should be communicating every day, every meeting, as many times as we can. Uh, one of the forms that you talk a lot about is storytelling. And I thought that was really, really good. Can you just share your thoughts on storytellers and how leaders can become better at this? Sure. Um, storytelling has been around for tens of thousands of years. And there's a reason that it persists. It takes new and different forms, but stories connect with the head and the heart. They engage, they inspire. Um, there, there's just a power that, that researchers have been trying to figure out forever about why are stories so powerful? Now, there's brain science involved. Again, I, I'm not qualified to talk about all that, but I think every leader understands the power of story. 
what I find very few leaders have done is commit to become a better storyteller. And I think you do that by reading great storytellers. I think you can read books about storytelling. I think you practice storytelling. You can hire you a coach to help you as a communicator um, and on and on and on and on. And one year, a few years back, that was the focus of my annual development plan. And Mm -hmm. I'm looking for storytelling conferences and I'm looking for storytelling books. And I hired a coach to work on storytelling because I want to get better at being a storyteller. So again, it's, it's a little bit of the knowing doing gap. I bet if you surveyed every one of your listeners and says, is storytelling important for leaders? Probably 95% of them would say yes. Then you say, okay, how many of you are a master storyteller? Well, that number's going to be small. You say, great, that's fine. You're still on the journey. How many of you have that in your development plan for next year to become a better storyteller? I think you got to work on it. It's a skill. It's a skill. I think that's such a great challenge to leaders. And I, I don't know if you would have gone to this. I think I heard John Maxwell talk about this one once. Isn't there like a, a national storytellers competition in mm-hmm. Nashville? Have you gone mm-hmm. to this? I have not been to that, but I am aware okay. of it. Yeah, yeah. I hope to get to it someday. I hope to get to it someday. Yeah. I love that you put that as part of your annual growth plan. I mean, I would never think to put that as an area to grow in, but uh, challenge noted. So thank you for that. Uh, um. Just as we wrap up talking about the book, I am curious, you know, obviously you worked at Chick-fil-A for over 40 years. Uh, when it comes to onboarding people on, into your culture, what advice do you have for leaders? Because I think a lot of organizations miss this on actually onboarding and getting people engaged. Any thoughts there? Well, sure. Uh, probably a lot. That, that's the kind of question <laughs> we, we need an hour to talk about. Um, some, some of your listeners will know the name Howard, uh, not Howard, um, um, Ritz Carlton, former head of Ritz Carlton. Oh, um, Horse Schultz. Horse, Horse. I was saying, I was Horse Schultz. I was thinking about Howard Schultz. We talked about Starbucks earlier. Uh, yeah. He he has had a huge influence on Chick Fil A. By the way, he is a friend and consultant, and he's helped us with hospitality. He and uh, Dan are buddies, <clears throat> and he challenged us twenty five years ago. He said, um, "The first forty hours of someone's employment." is the most important 40 hours in their entire career. And it was like, he said, yeah, you need to, you need, you need to be very thoughtful, very strategic, very planful. Everything from don't have them come in and they can't find their desk or they don't have a computer or they don't know any, like, no, who's going to greet them? What's their agenda for the first week? Who are they going to spend time with? What, you know, they're like, that first 40 hours. Now, <clears throat> is that literal? I don't know, but it's a pretty good benchmark. What are you going to do with somebody in their first week? How intentional? How strategic? What messages do you want to embed in that person's head and heart in the beginning? Do you want to talk about the culture? Do you want to show them the culture? Do you want to model the culture? Um, I know one of our leaders here, On the very first day, he chose to take all his new employees to a restaurant because he said, you're going to work in that building, but Chick-fil-A is out here Wow! and took them to the restaurant because he was trying to create that first impression. I think it matters. I'll tell you one more thing. Uh, Dan, uh, as our former president and CEO, Dan Cathy, he actually did orientation for all new operators, probably for 20 years himself wow. as the CEO and the president. He spent a day with them. I don't mean wow. he just said, hi, y'all. He spent a day with all those new people for, again, maybe for 20 years. That's so crazy. I just think, I think you've got to, you've got to elevate the priority of that opportunity. Can you influence them for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years as a, as an employee. Sure you can, but, but horse challenged us and convinced us let's make that first 40 hours as, as high impact as possible. And uh, just speaking of horse, just a fun story. Cause I think I, I, I met with him and interviewed him after we spoke, but I was talking to David Salyers about this. I, I believe horse is the one actually responsible for my pleasure. Were you in the? Were you in that meeting when that happened? Well, but he, he didn't. He didn't want you guys to use it. But 
Yeah, they're different. They're different versions of that history. I don't know that I was in the meeting you're referring to. Um, I would argue that Truett and Horst agreed on that. I heard Truett say it first, <laughs> but I think he probably observed it while he was at the Ritz. So okay, there's okay. certainly linkage there. And then Horst helped us create the strategy for how do you create a culture of hospitality? Wow. And so that's been his huge contribution over the years. Well, yeah. Anything else just open-ended you want to talk about cultural roles or leave us with? <sighs> yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave with a story that I closed the book with. Uh, some of your listeners will have seen the Steven Spielberg movie, Ready Player One. Or perhaps they read Ernest Klein's novel by the same name. And I'm not going to give away the whole thing for you here uh, for those that haven't. But it, it's a fascinating story. It takes place in two worlds. It takes place in the real world and a virtual world. Hmm. And the virtual world is called the Oasis. And the hero of the book is a young man named Wade Watson. <clears throat> and Wade is trying to explain why people go to the Oasis. And he said, people go to the oasis for what they can do there. And they stay because of who they can become. Wow. Now, I know it's not appropriate for me to have an aspiration for your listeners, but I do. I would love for every one of them to create a culture so compelling, so life-giving, so soul enriching that it would attract people and they would come there because of what they could do. They could get a job, but they would stay because of who they could become. And you can create that kind of culture if you aspire, amplify and adapt. Wow. Well, Mark, thank you for the book. Uh, again, thank you for all the books that you put out into the leadership world. You've impacted the world in a very significant way. And I'm very excited. Is it book number 13 on ego? 13? It's actually not on ego. It's on leadership. But okay. but we've identified ego as the primary barrier. So we will talk about ego for sure. Okay. We'll include links to everything we talked about in the show notes. So leaders, make sure you pick up a copy for you and your team to go through. Anything else you want to leave us with? As Just far as last logistics? thought, uh, there are yeah. going to be people who are going to have questions. I mean, you asked yes. some great questions today. Uh, if they want to reach out to me, my cell number is 678-612-8441. Amazing. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Leader, if you're driving or anything like that, uh, you can pick that up there. So Mark, thanks again. Hopefully we'll do this again sometime. And uh, just thanks for everything you do for leaders. Thank you, Doug.